Hello, hello everyone, wherever you are in the world. Today it's great to see you. This is a like, totally unexpected thing to be here. And I think this is what we are going to be doing also in the next couple of weeks. We're going to be adding YouTube to our show. And I think it's going to be a great thing for you because it's easy to access. Even if you don't have a LinkedIn account, you can go for this. You can go to LinkedIn. You can choose whatever you want. So I hope you are enjoying so far because we have great things today. And great things are also coming. So in the next half an hour, probably you're going to learn something new. You're going to understand how your brain works. You're going to understand what happened with your biases. Everyone has biases. I think it's hard to work on them. And I think the, the, the first thing where you have a bias is to accept it. Without accepting it, it's hard for you to, you know, to understand the, how your brain works. So before talking to our special guest, I wanted to thank Greg Pitcher. He is here with us today. Well, here, he's in New Zealand, and he's gonna be helping me, and I'm helping him too, with the show today. And as you probably know, there has been a disconnection between science and organizational change and company for a long time. And one of the things we try to provide and understand is how we connect science and connect what we know and connect. Well, you know, sometimes science is not just about um, uh, testing something. It's about uh, understanding that there, there, there was someone doing something before that you can also apply. And this is one of the things we try to do with the, the show. So I welcome today Mora and Mora Barclay is the uh, is going to be she's going to be talking about the neuroscience of uh, bias, and she's a co-founder of Changing Greatly. And I think Changing Greatly is a difficult topic. Where you are physically, because we know Greg where he is. Where where are you now? I'm physically in Seattle, and I would like to, to call out that somehow we have managed three time zones on this call. This already <laughs> is a huge success. So if it was a little bit later, Mr. Badass Agile, Greg, we should be raising a glass, even though it's really early. It's really early where Greg is right now. Well, so, and Justin is not here. There could be could have been one more, right? <laughs> that's right. I mean, it's it's yeah, that's right. If JJ was here, it'd be one more time zone. So we rule. That's just we're gonna start there. We totally are ruling today. Yeah. So let, let me start with a very basic question, and it is how do I know I have certain biases as a you know in the company or somewhere else? How I make sure that because obviously in order to know that I have certain biases, I, not, I need to acknowledge them first. So imagine you go to a company, where do you see people that are having certain biases, but people are not able to see that? How you do it? Where do you start? We start with accepting that you don't know you have bias. Oh, that's a good starting point, right? <laughs> that's a problem. Everybody needs to accept that bias is typically implicit and unconscious. And when we can accept that, we can remove shame, blame, and judgment from the equation. We need to stop blaming people for their core beliefs because they are unconditionally, or to say, they, they are unconsciously conditioned. And it's an anthropological phenomena. And one of the reasons that I wanted to create this class is to help people understand what the brain is up to and how it creates bias, why it creates bias, and then what do we do? Because bias is in the way. Bias separates us, bias disadvantages people. I think we can all agree on that. So the purpose of this particular session is to introduce you to the inevitability of your humanity and to connect the experience the human experience with the science, right? Like you, you talked, uh, Eric, about the disconnect, right? Between science and organizational change. What I would like to do is connect the human experience with the data, because frankly, data doesn't teach, data doesn't really change. Not until we decide to embody that information and have a human experience, do things change? That's where the traction happens. So I want to help connect people to the 
uh, to the theory because, listen, <laughs> I am not a scientist. I want to be clear about that. I'm not a scientist. JJ is the scientist. If he were here, I, I would I would be like, is that right? I would be asking him all the time. I'm an autodidact. I have come to this through being an embodied anatomy instructor and rooting everything that I have come to understand in the world in my physical experience. So helping people really embody the neuroscience of how they're wired, how it contributes to their bias and and forgive themselves immediately, then maybe we can start there with an open mindset or a growth mindset. Because I'll tell you, there is nothing like having your core values, your core beliefs, your world value challenged to just shut that mindset right down, just straight into fixed. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to talk about some of the processes to help people recognize when that happens I'll, I'll talk about some of the quote unquote signs and symptoms that you have a fixed mindset around certain core beliefs. So uh, let, 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 me, let me tell you something before uh, Greg goes. When I was in New Zealand, and this is what I realized, um, it, it, I had certain biases. I work, I'm working on this. It was a long time ago. Uh, I passed through a building and I realized all the builders were women. The, all of them were women. And, and then I continued walking, and then I saw they were repairing a street, and all the builders were women. And this is something which is normal in New Zealand, for example, or relatively normal, but it's not normal in other parts of the world where, you know, we, we have biases for almost everything. I think it's, it's part of the culture, and part of this is, is, is just, um, I think traveling helps a lot to reduce those biases. Um, and this is why I wanted now... To, to go for you, I know people in New Zealand have less biases than myself. I've been working hard, but then look, go, go for the question, Greg. I know you, you have something to say. Right. Yeah. So, Maura, with accelerated change, how much more a bias is becoming an issue? I think that accelerated change and innovation doesn't take into consideration our ability to innovate our own selves. And, and something that Eric was talking about earlier, I mean, we were joking around about our ability to be agile and respond to the fact that the LinkedIn server wasn't working today. We needed to pivot. We needed to change. An openness to self-innovation is absolutely essential to respond appropriately to accelerated change and growth. Mm. Our minds are not wired to handle all this constant uh, data stream we're just not wired for it. Our nervous systems are, I mean, our brains are handling it. Our, 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 uh, our limbic brain, our amygdala processing billions of bits of data per second, but we're only really able consciously to process somewhere between like 1200 bits of data. And even then 95% of our decision-making is done unconsciously. So bringing about a, 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 a gut check about our ability to, be conscious and respond in the same at the same rate that we are we are asking i should say our environment to to accelerate and innovate we have to we have to find a a symbiosis with our environment a symbiosis inside ourselves so that we are in harmony with what we're trying to do otherwise there will be crash and burning there will be all kinds of uh, i'll just call it a dissonance Nice. Thank you. You're welcome. And I think that um, it's interesting what you are saying about innovating your, with yourself, because many companies are talking about innovation. Uh, some companies, do they, they have kind of strategic innovation where they take into account how many people they got, how many skills they have, how many resources they got, and they say, okay, with what we got, we can achieve plus minus this. But most companies, I would say, it's not a strategic they just come up with, um, you know, high hopes so that they're going to achieve something. And what happens is they put people under a lot of pressure. When people are under pressure, amygdala um, start releasing cortisol, and the number of perspective, obviously, we can see is is lower, um, and, and, and biases. So I just wanted to mention in, in 2012, Antonio Nagel in, in Madrid, he did a fantastic research where he realized that 110 milliseconds the, the, the amygdala ignite and, and start releasing cortisol and, and then start changing our thoughts. 
And then when we become aware of this, it's 220 milliseconds, which is later. So there is no way we can, unless we do a process of self-reflecting, there is no way we can do that. Our, we are completely biased. So how we do that, how we work on trying to make sure that, and also, you know, people have their egos too. So how we work with people in order to realize they have biases. I want to, uh, th so th there's a lot to unpack there, Eric. And I want to start with the idea that for companies who want to innovate, innovations happen in one way, no matter what your strategic objectives are. Yeah. There's only one way to achieve those, which is through people. And you must innovate your culture first and foremost. And psychological safety is the backbone of a culture that innovates. For example, you have to have a safe to fail culture. If you truly want to innovate and you want to fire up your human capital to uh, you know, like innovation from the ground up, for example, uh, bottom up innovation, like Kentucky Fried Chicken does this in London, by the way, I just heard an amazing uh, innovating teams webinar this morning on LinkedIn about how they do bottom up. They encourage people. So it's, they're not asking their people to innovate, but make sure you don't fail. <laughs> Good luck with that. Let me know how that goes. It's not human nature. So what we need to do is leverage the human in human capital by creating psychologically safe spaces and, and culture innovations where people can thrive. Once you have established that, so what we're talking about here is foundation after foundation after foundation. You can't come in as a CEO and suddenly say, we're going to innovate, we're going to do all this great stuff, unless you have made it safe for people to do so. And to your point, when you're dealing with egos and personalities, and when people are met with their biases, and when I say met with, there are different ways to be met with your bias, which we will talk about later. It will create what you just described, which is the adrenaline response, where you go into your survival brain, the amygdala fires up, tells you that there's a threat, you get a cortisol dump and an epi dump, epinephrine dump. So now you're all, you're all fakakta, as, as my people say. You're not in a space where you are going to be open because you don't feel safe and you're going to assume a defensive posture and all movement, all growth has shut down. That's not the correct way to deal with bias. And we have to first understand where it comes from. That way we can let ourselves off the hook a little bit. And P.S., our egos are also a complete sort of fictional uh, construct that was created in our childhood through unconscious conditioning. So it's just neural pathways. So I'm in the business of, number one, creating psychologically safe cultures and doing uh, change management from a human lens whereby we look at what we need to do to change because the organization will change as a result of us changing. So the commitment first needs to be to self-innovation, to an open mindset where you are, you're, you're okay to hear some feedback and then you need to train people on how to give that feedback. And there's been a lot of research around this and according to the, the, the latest research that I've seen, being confronted with bias or worldview uh, change or a worldview challenge, let's call it, it is best done one-on-one. -on -one. No matter what, you know, all these huge consultants, nothing against the huge consultants, the consultancy firms. I use their data all the time. So I'm very excited that they exist, right? The thing that they they don't really seem to get though, is this is a boots on the ground reconciliation. There is no large scale way through this, according to the, the, the research that I've seen. This is a boots on the ground, one-to-one. -one. We're going to change this culture one person at a time. We need to equip our people, one, with anticipating that it's going to happen, two, letting it be okay, three, creating psychological safety and compassion on both sides. That's how we're going to get through it. That way your ego doesn't feel assaulted. It feels seen. And even though it's challenging, we're all operating on an, uh, an equal footing of mutual respect. This is the key. And um, Maura, many companies have been conditioned from from a long time of not having psychological safety, um, following top down, um, 
and being controlled or being told what to do. So how do they, obviously there's still those bias because conditioning also brings biases. How do they help? And when you're conditioned, you're quite often not aware of those biases. So how can they first realize that they may have some biases in that area? Okay. What you're speaking about, if I'm not mistaken, Greg, is command and control leadership culture. Mm -hmm. So first of yep. all, uh, every first thing I tell people is you have bias. It's natural. Get over it. Like, let's just start with there. <laughs> like, of course you have bias. The command and control leadership style is an artifact of the industrial revolution mm. where people on the industry, on the warehouse floor or the construction floor, we just needed to get them to work more efficiently so that they could produce the widget more quickly and more money could be made. So it's about efficiency. That mm. doesn't work. I'm going to say this super clear and I'm saying it out of love. That doesn't work in the knowledge economy. Mm. It never really did, and it never will. And the piece that broke the camel's back, the straw, COVID was the straw that broke the camel's back because every single employee who's in the knowledge economy, who's hired for talent and skills, you can't throw efficiencies at them. That's not how the knowledge economy works. And I am not an expert on this, but I am an expert on people. And when you are looking at the attrition going on, when you see 600 billion, that's billion with a B as in boy, a B as in boy, oh boy, that's a lot of money, folks. We have $6 billion in waste from attrition and burnout and quiet quitting and all of this. That is an indication that something is amiss in our leadership style. It's natural. You inherited it. Now, the question is, how willing are you to make a personal innovation, a change in your own, uh, uh, your own understanding of what success looks like, what, what true human innovation looks like at a personal level and at an organizational level in order to reclaim a piece of that 6B? And I can tell you what's really going to get people, Greg, is the companies who figure this out are going to absolutely own the market. And it will be an economic imperative for leadership style to change to flotilla, to change to more modern leaders, uh, leadership styles that are based on empathy, compassion, and care. It is the CEOs and the executive teams who can effectively not just by their own estimation, because there's been a lot of research done on this. <laughs> really? Executive teams are like, we're doing it. We're doing an amazing job, say 98% of the executives. And according to a Deloitte study, 50% of the employees are like, uh, no, you're not. There's a bubble there. It was a bubble that was conditioned. It was trained. It was taught. Nobody is wrong here. It is just a matter of it doesn't work. It's not working anymore. So it's time to up level. And this isn't a page one rewrite. It's, it's an adjustment. It's a, it's a slight adjustment and it will require growth mindset on the part of executive teams, which is going to feel scary. And that is correct. Because let me tell you, this is not a safe time to be a white man in this country. The rules have changed. And that is a scary thing. And they are in a defensive posture because it doesn't feel safe to be a white guy right now. And that's totally legitimate. So we need to create psychological safety for these men who are being asked to change decades, if not millennia of conscious and cultural, unconscious and cultural conditioning in order to meet this new way of being and new way of doing. So let me move the conversation into uh, diversity in organizations. When, when you work with teams where teams, people are all different, but imagine that you have uh, different ages that sometimes I've been working with different ages and, and the teams are great, but they need a kind of foundation first. How you do that? Because obviously uh, when you grow up, I grew up in a world where you know there was no internet. I used to believe what people said. Now it's easy. So sometimes when people have different habits, also based or 
on the, the time. Not everyone. I consider myself a millennium. Um, I'm not. I don't have, like this kind of stigmatizing people because they were born. But there, there are certain things that you can see, you know, access to information and other things. So how you do and how you work with teams where everyone is completely different, you arrive to that company and the, the team is not, is a little bit dysfunctional. What the next, the first step you do, you first talk to whom, how you do it? Because I imagine there are many um, leaders, managers, other people uh, trying to understand how you work and what you do. Indeed. So there's two, I would say there's two aspects to this. What a great question, by the way. One of the things that I, I, I've aligned myself with a behavioral assessment company called Predictive Index, which helps people understand their work style in a very uh, consistent and uh, scientifically data, uh, scientifically validated framework. So one of that's one way in. That is what I call the soft approach. That way people can look at their work style and look at the work style another and figure out, oh, this is why we're struggling communicating. So that's one of the first ways uh, I like to approach this is when you look at team dynamics. Now, if we can look at it from a, a scientifically validated a psychometric assessment point of view, that kind of, it allows people to disassociate from personality so that they can look at, oh, communication style. And let me tell you, this is very different than Myers-Briggs, different than Clifton Strengths Finders, DISC, everything that I've ever taken. And, and, and this is certainly not a, a, disparage, a disparagement against those, those companies and what they do because they produce really awesome data that is useful. This is an entirely different approach, however. It's been around since the 50s. And it allows people to disassociate personalities and ego to work style. So you can build dynamic teams. You can see the kind of team that you've got and start there. The second piece is to understand why people have the reactions that they do to people who are in the out group. So the first thing to know about our bias is it's built brick by brick as a survival instinct to belong to a group. We have a deeply rooted need to belong in a group. It is a survival impulse that is born from the necessity of, uh, of uh, uh, security. Our brains are still in the hunter-gatherer days where if you didn't belong to your tribe, guess what? You're out. If you didn't learn how to, how to survive, how to look like you belong to your tribe, then you might be cast out and die of exposure or uh, you know, a saber-toothed tiger. That's how deeply rooted our need to belong is. And this is where we learn how to do it. So what this does neurologically, well, first of all, we have the super cool thing called mirror neurons that teach us how to imitate. So we are showing, we're giving evidence that we belong with our, with our in-group. And once our, uh, and I wish JJ were here because I'd just be like, what do you think about this, JJ? Uh, and this is all theory based on a bunch of white papers and research that, that I've read. There's this um, stronger, stronger neural uh, empathic response to people who we recognize facially as being in our in-group. And there is a heightened neural threat response to the out-group. So this is where we learn, this is where we get these sort of impulses that they're so deep in us that we don't even mean to. We don't, we don't realize that they're influencing us given, again, 95% of what we do is unconscious. So we have these deeply wired responses that are influencing us beyond our conscious awareness. And the other piece of this is as we are, as we're working in teams, our core beliefs which were built by our in-group, are influencing us without our knowing. And uh, a, a perfect example of this, I was told you I was going to give you like signs and symptoms. When you see feedback from white male managers to, let's say, uh, any female, regardless of her color, and they'll say things like um, very general things, uh, you know, team player, easy to get along with, you know, these types of things, you would never see that from a white male supervisor to another white male uh, direct report. You'd hear about the value he created because there's this in-group empathy that's just there. And there's, a, an in, there's an out-group disconnect that is unconscious where the supervisor doesn't realize that he's, he is not providing the specific data because he does, he can't quite relate to her. And there's a completely different subset 
of evaluation going on. Uh, same thing with a white, a white supervisor and a black direct report. They'll, they'll say, uh, you know, something about productivity or something like that. And the implication is laziness because they grew up with the narrative that African-Americans are lazy and they see it in the media. And once you have a core belief built, your brain is wired to only show you things that confirm your beliefs. It's called confirmation bias. And your brain will kick out data that conflicts with your core beliefs. So even though you're presented with all this stuff, your mind's like, yeah, no, we're not going to pay attention to that. Pay attention to this because it's trying to keep you out of cognitive dissonance, which is a mental discomfort. You can have a full on adrenaline response. Like you talked about, Eric, cortisol, adrenaline, or an, an, an epi dump because a core value is being challenged. Like when everyone from the fifties learned that smoking's bad, there was a like massive, <laughs> like group consciousness, cognitive dissonance. They're like, Oh my God, you know, I've been killing myself and not realizing it. So anticipating that you have bias, it's unconscious, it's driving you. It doesn't mean you are racist. It means that you learned things that you will need to, I would say, mm, innovate. You've learned narratives that are no longer serving you and are interfering, frankly, with your ability to work an authentic harmony with other people and getting really clear and accountable with your own personal culture is step one. In my personal culture, I learned this. I learned it. It let's, let's get the judgment out. Okay. Is it working? Okay. No, it doesn't work. All right. Now what? Right. It's instead of taking it as it's who I am taking it as it's what I learned. Let yourself off the hook. Let's learn something different. That's it. Thank you for uh, Greg. Greg, what, one one thing is that um, before you go, I'm sorry, but then I feel tempted to mention kind of anti bias, which is I, I used to have a, a friend of mine. He was Afro descended from. Um, he was working in London and for a huge bank, and and he was going through an interview process for a general director of a huge bank, and and I said, well, you have the skills. And then you to, he told me, you don't know how hard it is for an Afro-descendant to, to go through this, this process. And I never thought of this because I'm not Afro-descendant. I'm Latino, but then so sometimes um, it's difficult for you to see the biases because you are not in those situations. It's difficult for me also to uh, maybe uh, to see a situation from a women's perspective because right. I'm, I can imagine that. But then many times we play in our head, we do this rehearsal of situations based on our limitations and based on the, obviously the situation we lived before. If I'm not an Afro-descendant and nobody discriminated me, I don't have that in my head. I never thought of that. And this is the other part is empathizing and trying to understand the bias of the other person and why it's there, right? And then Greg, you can go after. <laughs> yeah, and, and Eric, you brought up something really important that I would like to highlight here. The thing that it's, it's sort of disadvantage through omission. And let me explain that. What I mean by that is when people are discriminated against, the obstacles put in front of them make it harder and harder. There is a disadvantage that is put in place by uh, systemic racism and misogyny and ageism. And it's, it was built by a certain socially dominant group to serve and make that group, make their life easy. So, and it, by the way, it's completely subjective. It happens to be white heterosexual men here in the US, but it could have been anybody. Go to any country, you'll see who the socially dominant, dominant group is the rules yes, tend to, okay, exactly, it yes. tends to favor them. And so if you're Han Chinese, the rules are built to favor you, right? And not, and not a hill tribe person, you know? So this is my point. I, I see this all over LinkedIn, uh, an African, uh, an African immigrant who is like summa cum laude in her, in her law school. She graduated with honors, incredibly talented, working mother, just the epitome of grace 
and professionalism. She walks into the courthouse, she goes through security and the white security guard says, I'm sorry, you can't go into the courthouse without an attorney present. It's these moments that white men never get. These are the obstacles that women and people of color have to deal with every single day. It's built into the hiring process. It's built, in to the, it's built into the career pathing. And until we can deconstruct that and, and highlight the obstacles, that's what, what, what everybody needs to see. And white men need to be willing to look at the obstacles without feeling judged because they're not doing, nothing's happening necessarily, quote unquote, on purpose, maybe a while ago, but the entitlement and privilege, uh, I, I think there's a lot of white men who are not about that. They, it, so what we're doing is cleaning up. We're constantly cleaning up that uh, disadvantage that was put in place. And it's essential that the socially dominant group are able to see these obstacles. So when you see the path for a white man, it's just like, boop, did he have to work hard? Sure he did. But what he didn't have to do is go through all these obstacles that were put in his way. He didn't have to do that. And that's the thing that a lot of white guys don't understand because it's not presented to them. Or guess what? Their bias kicks it out and marks it as unimportant because it doesn't affect them. Completely mm -hmm. natural. You have to fight that in order to be, allow yourself to be impacted and have empathy. Remember, you are wired to have a neural empathy response to your in-group, which means you have to consciously allow yourself to come into empathy for an out-group. This is emotional intelligence, what we're talking about. It were, you are being called upon to increase your emotional intelligence. And when you do, you will get it. Thank you for that, uh, Maura. It's um, I, I I looked in from New Zealand to the world basically, right? Because uh, New Zealand is reasonably isolated. Um, we have slightly different cultural aspects and things like that. But there's definitely what you're saying um, happening. But when I look in outside the world, all I'm being bombarded by is media, and and I don't know. <laughs> what is actually truth anymore. So how do you deal with that with a biased perspective? Well, the truth is the truth. Oops. That's a pain in the ass, isn't it? What you believe will be true for you. Uh, let, me, let me put a fine point on this for you, Greg. Have you ever seen the show Westwood? Or, is that what it's called? Future, the future one. I think yeah, it's called yeah, Westwood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I watched Westwood. it. Yes, with the with the yeah. they yes, created with the machines and they the created machines. this artificial world. Maybe Correct. if they, people don't watch it in New Zealand, but then okay. Then, well, uh, I'll give you the point. I'll, I'll make the point. Yes. So in the show, there are these uh, incredibly sophisticated robots, these humanoid robots that were all designed to create um, a a make believe like Wild West that uh, you, you, as a tourist, you could come in, pay the money, and you're putting the clothes, and you get to play act. So that right. was the idea. you can idea kill them if you want, and, and then you can kill them, but you know you're not killing a real person, but they look like a person. To go yeah. and do this thing. So here's, here's the point I'm making. They were programmed not to recognize anything outside of their reality. So one of them found a picture, and she looked at it, and she said, that doesn't look like anything to me. Now, let me, let me, let me uh, bring this into uh, to answer your question. My brother lived and worked in China for 21 years. Um, he's white like me, and he speaks perfect Mandarin to the point where when he was on the phone with people, they had no idea he wasn't a native speaker. And there, because at the time where he was in, the, in China, it was not really liberalized. It wasn't, it was, he went during the Tiananmen Square incident. So it was back in the 80s. There weren't a lot of white people there and certainly not white people who spoke the language, right? They're all tourists. So there was not a space in their brain for the reality, for the truth that there's other people other than Chinese nationals who can speak Mandarin. My brother was in the Guangzhou airport 
and they had changed. He heard them on the loudspeaker, but it was a lot of chaos that they'd moved the gate. So he went to a Chinese person it, uh, who uh, he heard him speak. So he knew he spoke Mandarin. He wasn't Cantonese. So this wasn't a language issue. And he said to the, in, into the Mandarin speaker, native Mandarin speaker in pitch perfect Mandarin. Did you hear what gate they moved the flight to? And the man looked at him with this weird expression and said to him in Mandarin, I don't speak English. Wow. This is what is called paradigm blindness. And I'm, I'm, that's an ableist term. So we'll call it contextual void. Okay. This individual did not have any contextual experience for that particular reality, which is a truth. Would you, would you not agree? It's true. People outside of Chinese, whatever you believe, your brain will show you only that. So mm. the truth is the truth. Whatever right. people are saying is what they believe. And if you want to start talking about universal truth, well, guess what? That is a conversation outside the innovation <laughs> world conference. <laughs> that is a whole different <laughs> kettle of fish, my friend. Truth is relative. When it comes to organizations, they get to decide what's the culture. Here's the truth in our organization. The truth is we value humanity. The truth is we value what you're adding to our culture. The truth is we need you aligned with our culture. If you want to gossip, you're not in alignment. You're not in alignment with our culture. You see? So the truth is what you believe, what you, how you act, and that's it. Everything else is a relative. There's, I would, I would, I would dare say there is no objective truth. I'm getting a little meta on you, but that's that's well, reality. I think we can we could take here for hours. I know it's just gonna. Now we're going uh, yeah, somewhere. Greg. I'm gonna speak to, to you later yeah. about this. I think we 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 rather meet somewhere. We decide we meet somewhere in the middle in yeah. Honolulu or somewhere else with Greg, and we have our <laughs> conversation. All right. So I will ask the question that Greg always asks, but then I have been able to ask now is what, what you're going to be talking during the conference and then Greg can go for a quick question and then we go because we have just four and a half minutes to go. Okay, very good. So uh, in the conference, I'm going to walk people through the genesis of bias, starting from early childhood development, all the way through how it presents in our adult lives and then how it is, how it, uh, how it presents at work, then how we can work with it, right? How we can navigate it. And I will, I will end with some instantly actionable, I would, uh, I really, it's, it's um, emotional intelligence tools. So it's partly to get people because our, our bias sneaks up on us, right? We're we feel sabotaged when someone presents it to us. So if it's not done, if it's not presented correctly, and if you are not ready, if you are not, if you've not been primed to, to be faced with it, it's not going to end in reconciliation or resolution. So I want to walk people through why they've got it so they can release their self-judgment, self-blame, get them in a place where they're more likely to have an open mindset and a growth mindset, give them tools to call it out and give them tools to reconcile when they get called out, right? Without being judged in a mutual respect way. And, and, and then uh, I'm going to give them a, a handout at the end about just all the tools that they have at their, at their disposal, some resources that they can check out so that they can keep growing and, and innovating themselves, keep up leveling themselves. And again, not a page one rewrite, folks. You ain't broken. There's nothing wrong with you. We just want to make it more comfortable for you to grow. That's it. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be uncomfortable, but I want to help you get comfortable with that discomfort. That is my goal in my, in my talk. Greg, go for the last one. We have two minutes to go. I just wanted to hear your, your question. Um, last just question. It, one final question about uh, discomfort. So there is um, some theory out there that when you're in discomfort, if you can sit with the discomfort for a long enough time, then you can actually learn how to deal with discomfort. And so... I'm assuming some of the things that you're talking about with emotional intelligence will also help with that side of things. 
Absolutely. I have a, a personal experience with this. I'm a longtime meditator. I come from the mind body space. That's where a lot of the stuff came from. And when I was diagnosed with cancer, I really had to use my tools. It is about whether or not you identify with the discomfort and take it personally, that leads to suffering. Or if you are able to witness it, not take it personally, not judge yourself about it and be able to make some space for it to exist and then make choices. So that is that moment you're talking about, Greg, where you respond versus react. Exactly. EQ awesome, Mora. Thank you very much for today. Thank you, Greg, for today. It's always nice that we make you wake up very early for this. <laughs> and thank you, Mora. It was very, very interesting conversation. I'm sure during the conference it's gonna be even more interesting yeah. We will also have a translation in 36 languages. So just to make sure that the whole world is, you know, listening to your knowledge, what you learn, and then what we can learn from that. So I appreciate you having with us today. And we're going to be airing this soon in LinkedIn. So thank you for your time today. Thank you for joining. We are ready to... Uh, change greatly today and I hope you see you soon in November for the event. Thank you very much for the time today. Thank and have you a good so day, much. folks. Great to meet you Thank both. You. Thank you. Thank you. The world is more complex than ever before, moving and changing at an incredible rate. No one is immune. Not even the most successful leaders of today's best-known companies. We are taking the global industry to new assumptions, beyond agile and business agility. Be ready to understand the science behind high uncertainty and accelerated change. Be ready to challenge your organization. Join us at the Enterprise Agility World Conference to know more. The largest event on science, organizational change, and enterprise agility. Enterprise Agility World Conference 